Good morning. Welcome to the investment meeting for the teachers retirement system, September 7th, 2023. I'll start by calling the roll. Brian Berge. Brian Berge, representing Mayor Eric Adams, present. Tom Spram. I'm here, Patricia. Good morning. Good morning. Gregory Faulkner. Present. Allison Hirsch. Allison Hirsch, representing controller Brad Land. Present. David Gazanski. Present. Victoria Lee. Present. We have a quorum, and I'll turn it over to Pierre. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Welcome, Greg. Thank you. It's meeting. I appreciate it. Welcome to the first uh, investment meeting of the school year. We start on a sad note because TRS lost a wonderful person, Susan Stang. Uh, she was a friend of all of ours. She taught me so much. Uh, we worked closely together so many years. She was a dynamic person, full of life. Uh, always had a good story. Uh, everything she said, it wasn't that she said funny things, everything she said was funny and she embellished. I always looked forward to seeing her. And uh, I walked in today and I feel such a great loss. So I just wanted to start. Uh, maybe we can stand with a moment of silence for our, our dear friend Susan Stang. Can stand for a moment of silence? Thank you. Ah. First thing we have the passport fund, the second quarter 2023 performance review. And Mike and Rosatan, it's all yours. Great. I will uh, share my screen to help facilitate the discussion. Uh, hopefully, folks can see that. So, I was really going to use the quarterly update to just provide a more holistic review of the prior fiscal year at a very high level. Um, you'll recall it was a strong 12-month uh, period ending June 30th for uh, equity returns. It's a U.S. stock, the U.S. stock market as a whole, up nearly 20% last year. Developed markets trailing very closely behind, up about 19% uh, in in U.S. dollar terms. Emerging markets with a very slight positive return uh, of about one and a half percent, and then across fixed income markets, obviously you know more notable, uh, more, more notably different numbers when you look at different sectors. Uh, we saw a very notable rise in interest rates over the last twelve to eighteen months, uh, and you can see that show up in the performance of the. Uh, Bloomberg U.S. Aggregate Bond Index, which had a modest negative return last year of about 1%, uh, and then corporate high yield uh, with, with uh, corporate bond spreads uh, and, and interest rate changes. Uh, last year, we saw a return of about 9.1%. We also saw a significant reversal of the rally in commodities that we saw in the prior 12-month period, and you can see uh, the commodities index down about 14% last year. So with that as a backdrop, I'll cover uh, very quickly at a high level the returns of the passport funds for that, that fiscal year. You can see here uh, in the one-year column on this page, the diversified equity fund ended the year with uh, assets of just over uh, $16.5 billion uh, with a total return of 18.2%. That was ahead of the global market composite index as well as the hybrid benchmark. Those benchmarks uh, you would expect to track relatively closely as we look forward based on how they're constructed. Uh, we saw some value add uh, in, 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 in terms of active manager outperformance, uh, particularly in the U, excuse me, in the international equity composite for the fiscal year and some very slight outperformance for the U.S. equity composite. When we look at the balanced fund last year, again, a mix of stocks and a conservative mix of stocks and bonds that fund uh, returned about 5.1% last year, roughly in line with its benchmark. The International Equity Fund on its own, with assets of about 245 million, that fund was up over 16% last year. The Sustainable Equity Fund, you can see, uh, had a, a very notably strong return of about 21.5%, a uh, uh, strong return in absolute terms. It did trail its benchmark, which was up over 27%. 
And then for uh, the two index options within the passport funds, the U.S. equity index option up over 18.8% and uh, the international equity benchmark, excuse me, international equity index fund up over 12%. So um, very strong environment for a lot of these very equity oriented funds, as you would expect, uh, and happy to report that we saw, uh, generally speaking, especially as it impacted the diversified equity fund, positive manager value add contributing to that. So um, beyond that, uh, I noted what was a pretty strong environment for the 12 months and year to date period. We saw that, that continue into July and Amanda is going to uh, cover off performance for uh, the passport funds in July. Just before we do that, I just wanna pause and see if there's any questions. Any questions for Michael? Thank you, Mike. Okay. So Amanda's going to do the. Uh... Um, so <laughs> as Mike mentioned, the month of July uh, was positive across um, equity markets. Um, you can see in that one month column for the month of July, um, most of your equity options uh, posting returns between three and three and four uh, percent for the most part. In terms of the market backdrop, we saw inflation coming in lower than expected, GDP a little bit better than expected, also strong corporate earnings. Um, we also had the both the Fed and the ECB hike rates another 25%, which was in line with expectations. All of those things combined to support uh, positive results across uh, the equity markets. Uh, the diversified equity fund uh, ended the month uh, a little over 17 billion in assets. Uh, with a return of 3.6%, um, and uh, really pretty equal contributions there between uh, the U.S. and non-U.S. components of that uh, of that fund. Uh, the balanced fund up 1.44 for the month. Um, that fund is uh, more conservative, with about 70% in in short-term bonds there. Uh, the International Equity Fund up about three and a half percent for the month of July, uh, and slightly trailing that uh, composite benchmark at four point three. Uh, the Sustainable Equity Fund continues to be one of the stronger performers for the year, up about four point four percent for the month of of July, and outperforming that uh, growth index. Um, and both of your uh, passive options, the U.S. and international equity indices, are tr uh, tracking their respective benchmarks as expected. Um, in terms of the year-to-date period, strong double-digit uh, results uh, across the board, with the exception of, of the more conservative balanced option. Um, and the sustainable equity fund continues to be the strongest performer year-to-date as well, uh, with a return of over 30% through the end of July. Um, continues to benefit from the current market environment, which has been favorable towards um, growth and particularly tech stocks. I'll pause there to see if there's any questions on July results. Any questions for Amanda for the uh, July 2023 performance review? Great. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Appreciate it. And we go on to the August 2023 market performance. Yep, I'll pull this up as I'm speaking. It's as today. good as July. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> that, was, that was where the story changed. No, no, no. Um, we can stop now. <laughs> yeah. Can't go ahead. We go to lunch. <laughs> so we saw a, uh, we did see a drawdown and a lot more volatility uh, during the month of August. Uh, the U.S. equity uh, net net, the drawdown there was about 2% with the Russell 3000 ending down about 1.9%. We saw uh, more negative returns for uh, international equity markets being driven by the EM part of the marketplace, which was down over 6%. Uh, developed markets did a little bit better, down 3.8%. Um, you know, we really, we really started to see a little bit more, um, I'll say jitters in the market tied to a lot of what we were seeing in the news cycle with respect to uh, concerns and uncertainty around uh, economic growth as well as inflation um, being, uh, you know, possibly a continued problem. I think the market in many ways was whipsawed by the headlines that were 
very different from day to day coming into especially the first part of August. Um, you know, I'll say the, the good news is since then, starting to feel as if um, the, the talking heads in the marketplace are, are mm -hmm. feeling a little bit more confident around uh, the U.S. economy as we look out. Um, Goldman Sachs lowered its its probability of, of a recession uh, for, for later this year, looking out over the next 12 months uh, to about 15 and 10 percent, if memory serves. And, um, you know, that's certainly expected to help with, uh, with the, the, the view forward on equity markets. Mm -hmm. You know, all of that said, there's also a strong argument out there for equity markets having, you know, rallied quite a bit this year and valuations getting getting a bit stressed. So, you know, we're cautiously optimistic about about that. Um, and then as we look across uh, the passport funds and the, the benchmark performance specific to those, um, you know, the diversified equity funds global market composite was down about two and a half percent in August. So we'd expect the fund to attract that and the international equity fund down probably a little over four percent. Um, and so, uh, you know, nothing really certainly notable there, um, but, but something we're very mindful of uh, as we continue thinking and discussing strategic asset allocation, which would be the topic for today. Thank you, Michael. Any questions for Michael on the August 2023 market performance update? Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Amanda. Next on the agenda, we have the pension fund performance update quarterly presentation. Let's pass that over to Steve. Great, great. Thank you very Thank much. You, so uh, I'm going to build on uh, what Michael and Amanda just presented. I thought they did an excellent job. Uh, so I'll try to keep my comments really more, more focused on the second quarter of calendar year 2023 or the fourth quarter of fiscal year 2023. Uh, it's confusing. So just as a way of background, my, my hope is through these these quarterly updates in particular to give you a sense for, for what's going on in, econ in the economy, how that impacts what's going on in the markets, and, and more importantly, how that impacts your, your uh, portfolio performance. So maybe just on the next slide, Wilfredo or Kate, whoever's driving today. Um, just a couple of quick comments, uh, again, building off of what Mike and Amanda said earlier. So the Fed is not necessarily done yet. Inflation actually has come down, come down very nicely uh, since over the past 18 months when the Fed started its hiking cycle. Uh, but I still think there may be one more hike out there for this year, perhaps uh, not in September, but maybe in November, depending upon the data. Uh, the ECB and the Bank of England and Europe are similarly restricting have a similarly restrictive monetary policy and financial conditions. Uh, there probably will be additional hikes there as well. The economy is slowing, but inflation is still stickier, and I'll show that in a slide in a moment. I'd say the last point of note uh, around inflation is that China is becoming really an outlier where not only have they had disinflation or a reduction in the rate of inflation, they've had outright deflation where prices are going lower, uh, which is a, a challenge that uh, uh, no central bank really wants to face. On the next slide, just a look at uh, historically um, the uh, inflation prints. And you can see that white uh, bar on the far right-hand side. Right now it's at 3.18%. That's CPI, that's headline CPI, the Consumer Price Index. You can see it's down significantly from the 9.1% it hit in June of 2022. So great progress there. Uh, the core PCE deflator actually is a little more sticky at 410. That's more of a challenge, I think, for the Fed, and it's something that they'll continue to focus on. Uh, and getting that level down to their 2% their targets probably may inquire, if not just time, perhaps another, another uh, additional rate hike. On the next slide, a look at what's referred to as super core inflation. This is a new slide for me, uh, but it really underscores the fact that there, there might be a little more work for the Fed to do. Uh, and again, that super core inflation, which excludes housing, uh, is still stuck between four and 5%. And getting it down to that 2% will be, uh, again, a function of time or additional hikes. On the next slide, very quickly on the right-hand side, you can see where inflation peaked in the US and red and, and, and blue in, in Europe and um, the uh, light gray bar in the UK, they've all come down directionally. You've seen the impact of tighter monetary conditions and, and, um, and fiscal policy uh, taking a, a effect and driving those um, uh, inflation levels down. On the next slide, a quick look at employment. US employment actually is slowing, but it's still relatively solid. We have had a uh, initial claims report today that uh, was stronger than expected. And the stock market, at least when I left the office, was selling off as a result. Um, but it's solid relative to monetary policy and what we've seen in terms of rate, Fed rate hikes, but also around expectations for an economic slowdown, which we're really not seeing reflected that strongly in the housing market. 
uh, average job growth over the past three months, uh, adjusted for um, uh, revisions, has been over 150,000 jobs um, per month, uh, which is above and beyond the level that's required in order to put new new uh, workers uh, to work. Uh, and finally, the unemployment rate uh, ticked up in August to 3.8%. 100% of that increase was due to more people entering the labor market, again, looking for new positions. On the next slide, just to look at those two fact last factors I talked about. So unemployment uh, on the, in the white and the lower right-hand side is actually, this, these are July numbers. We just had the August employment report last Friday. Uh, unemployment is now 3.6%. Uh, and the participation rate, again, not quite at levels that we saw pre-pandemic, but it now increased to 62.8%. So those are good things the Fed wants to see. More people getting back to work and a slow updrift in the unemployment level um, associated with a slowing economy, perhaps. On the next slide, um, real, again, I think Mike stole all my thunder here, but the U.S. economy has been stronger than expected. Uh, Europe is, is uh, slightly moving higher, but there's still some challenges. If you look at some of the numbers out of uh, Germany in particular, uh, it indicates a, a continued slowdown. And, and finally, China's uh, been disappointing relative to expectations. On the next slide, just a chart. And what I love about this chart, it looks at economic growth over a 10-year uh, period. It actually really shows how disruptive uh, the, the pandemic was beginning in the early part of 2020 and the volatility around economic growth and how things are starting to normalize, uh, though we still have some outliers. I talked about China disappointing relative to expectations. You can still see on the far right-hand side, the green bar, it's still generating a 4 to 5% GDP growth, again, below their expectations and what the, the world was hoping for as they come out of the pandemic, um, but still something to watch. On the next slide, a look at interest rates. So interest rate hikes are nearing an end. As I said, I think the Fed may have one more or perhaps they're done. I think there's probably another one or two hikes uh, to come from both the European Central Bank and the Bank of England. Uh, China has been cutting its, its uh, rates to actually stimulate growth. Uh, and J Japan is still very accommodated with negative official rates. On the next slide, this is a, a slide that, that uh, working with Dan Haas on a reporting team and risk management teams is, is, is put together. Um, if you look on the far right-hand side, you can see what looks like staircases. Those are actually rate hikes for uh, the uh, the Fed up top in white, the uh, ECB in green, and in the middle, the Bank of England. And to my last comment around the B Bank of Japan, they're on the in purple on the far right-hand side, lower corner. They still have negative rates. So at some point, those rates will have to normalize. I'm sorry for interrupting. We have a new stenographer with us. And they've asked if you can mention your name before you speak for um, minute purposes. Okay. Thank you. Great. Michael, can we just start over again? Yeah. I'm Steve Meyer, uh, right. this is the Bureau of Asset Management and Controller's Office. Uh, on the next slide, very quickly look at uh, where we are with Treasury yields and credit spreads. First, US Treasury yields continue to move higher. Uh, Mike talked about that earlier. Uh, we've seen a, a fair amount of volatility in rates throughout the year, a rally in, in rates moving lower in the first quarter, uh, but again, backing up in, in the summer, which I'll talk about in a moment. Credit spreads for investment grade and high yield bonds also are not pricing a recession and continue to tighten, which has driven some of the returns we've seen in, in investment grade and high yield uh, investments. On the next slide. So a couple comments here. Why don't we always talk? Why don't we look at these slides? What, what's the information value in here? The right curve on top, that's where we were as of August 22nd. You can see the yields have moved consistently higher uh, over, over the course of time since June of last year. And these are base rates. So this is considered the risk-free rates. And when we talk about credit spread, we talk about investment grade and high yield spreads. It's these base rates plus the spread on top. And that's your return when you invest in, say, a high yield bond. So that's why we focus on this. This is the risk-free rate, and a lot of credit that's extended throughout our economy is, is uh, driven off of these risk-free rates. And you can see they moved higher. On the next slide, a very quick look at where they are uh, more recently. Two-year yields today are slightly above 5% in white, uh, and 10-year um, uh, yields continue to be around 4 and a quarter. Uh, that reflects an inverted yield curve. Typically, when you a normally shaped yield curve will have an increased risk premium 
further out the curve. So as you take on more risk of inflation ticking up over the course of time, you're compensated. So typically you'd buy a 10-year yield or something above what you'd buy a two-year yield. This inversion basically reflects the fact that the market is anticipating a reduction in, um, in hopefully inflation uh, in official short-term rates, which will drive two-year yields lower over time. Um, and again, that's and over the course of time, I think, Mike, what is Rokatom's estimate for inflation for the next 10 years? It's two and a half-ish? Uh, two, two yeah. point four, four five. Three. Yeah. 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 So that's what we look at. Exactly. Two. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> no, I thought it was two, two and a half. Two and a half. Two point four. So this is a slide I kind of touched on earlier. We have the base rates. Again, whatever they are, we're reflecting that red curve. Um, and again, it's an inverted curve. These are high yield and investment grade spreads. Investment grade spreads because there's lower risk associated of defaults and downgrades in, are reflected in the white. They're slightly under 120 basis points. The high yield spreads, however, uh, are at 380 basis points. You can see that, that it's higher than it was, say, a year ago, not necessarily compelling in terms of its return, given that there's a potential for a recession. Recession risk is not present in the current uh, spreads, which could create uh, buying opportunities down the road. But again, the reason why Mike will talk about this later, investment grade and high yield uh, asset classes are more attractive now is because base rates are higher and credit spreads are higher and potentially could go even higher if we do see a downturn in our economy. On the next slide, Again, I think Mike and Amanda did a great job talking about what we've seen over time, but uh, stocks have had a very strong year and bonds have been volatile and generally weaker more recently. Um, this following slide is something you've seen typically when I go through performance, but uh, we thought it was better here. Um, the upper portion of that slide, let's, let's look at the second quarter 2023 calendar year. You can see it's all black. So equities, uh, the Russell 3000 has delivered an 8.39% return, developed XUS 2.67, and emerging markets, again, which Mike touched on, uh, a little under 1% uh, for the quarter. Uh, bonds have had more challenges. Um, you can see that the long duration, as yields move up, it hurts long duration bonds more, uh, down 2.3%. Uh, the custom index, which is a slightly shorter duration, has a, a, a minimum maturity holding of, of five years and beyond, uh, has sold off 1.94%. Investment grade corporates, because of the backup in yield, it's actually driven a negative return there as well. High yield is a little different because the coupons on high yield is so much higher, it cuts the duration in half. The duration on a high yield index or investment uh, program is one half of what it is for investment grade because you get more money throughout the course of time with those higher coupons. Again, another reason why we like high yield, and I know Mike's gonna talk about that in a little bit. On the next slide, a quick look at the equity markets. There's a lot of green in the screen. Again, to echo what's been already said, uh, equities have done well over the year to date uh, and for the last uh, fiscal year, of course. This is year to date for 2023. Um, and there are two components of your return. So as a U.S. dollar investor, if you buy, say, the, the S&P 500, your return is what it is because it's dollar denominated. You're, you're investing in dollars, you're getting back dollars. It's a 15.37% return, again, year to date for the first half of the year. Um, it's a little different. So if you look at Euro stocks, for example, um, <coughs> Euro stocks, they're up 13%, which is great, but actually because the euros appreciated relative to the dollars that sold off a little bit this year, it's delivered a 14% return. Um, and I'd say it's more dramatic when you go down and you look at the Nikkei uh, at the bottom under Asia Pacific. That stock market is up 23.28%, but the return as a U.S. dollar investor is only 10.26% because the uh, dollars appreciated relative to the yen. It's more expensive to bring those those yen back into dollars at 147 yen to the dollar. And those are the components that we look at when we talk about these things. World bond markets on the next slide. Just a quick look. Uh, these are 10-year uh, U.S. Treasury yields and sovereign yields around the world. You can see that uh, year to date, uh, as the time of this writing, we had a 34 basis point increase in yields. That means prices are lower. And that's the top line in the United States just read across to the far right hand side. Uh, in Europe, it's been mixed. Um, sovereign uh, results uh, have been both up and down depending. Uh, and you can see that there's an example in the United Kingdom. Yields are much higher. They're up 77 basis points uh, as they continue to tighten uh, monetary policy to slow the economy. And inflation still been a little sticky there as well. And in uh, Asia, you can see that uh, they're mostly, yields are mostly, uh, bond prices actually are mostly lower. 
Um, and if you look at Japan, you can see that the, the uh, yields have actually gone up 25 basis points. Japan's interesting because they've got negative official interest rates at negative 10 basis points. They've also got something called yield curve control that artificially holds down the yields of the 10-year treasuries uh, or JGBs uh, for that matter. So they've actually loosened some of the constraints. They were targeting 10-year yields just at a half of 1%. Now they've loosened that up to half of 1% to 1%. And that's reflected here with yield moving up uh, to 66 basis points in this case. I know I'm throwing a lot at you. I'm just trying to build, build more of a foundation. <laughs> Uh, on the next slide, just a quick look. You can see where rates have turned, uh, performance has turned. The left hand charts are equity returns, US, non US, and emerging, all moving up in the right direction. On the right hand side, that's the, the, the Bloomberg Ag. It's actually called the Barclays Ag here, but it's technically now the Bloomberg Ag. And really just underscores the fact that we saw an incredible amount of volatility uh, over the last two years uh, with um, the Ag delivering a negative 16% 16, 16 return in 2022. It's actually come back. We saw a nice rally in the early part of the year, and it's giving some of that back now with, with an increase in yields, which means lower bond prices. And the next slide, just a couple of things to note. Again, recent news. Uh, you may have read in the paper that the U.S. Uh, Treasury uh, debt was downgraded by Fitch from AAA to AA+. A lot of people scratch their heads at the, the timing of that, um, but I think there is information value in that and, and concerns of the size of the deficits we continue to run and some of the, uh, the dislocations in our political processes around the debt ceiling and the issuance of debt uh, out of Washington. The other thing worth, note is, worth noting is that the artificial intelligence is, is certainly a very strong topic today. You know, there are issues about some of the AI companies perhaps being slightly overvalued. NVIDIA has been picked on as the, the primary chip maker. Um, but I do actually believe artificial intelligence will have a profound difference uh, in our economy, our productivity, um, uh, and, and uh, returns over time. But we'll see how that plays out over the next five years. A couple more uh, uh, food for thought ideas here. This is actually a chart that shows um, some of the challenges associated with the, the regional bank issues that we had in uh, March, April, and May. Um, and it specifically looks at the, the, the Silicon Valley bank collapse. You can see that dotted line towards the left. This is actually cumulative loan growth for U.S. banks. Uh, and it looks at the blue line is 2022. The red line, which really hasn't moved that much and is below 2%, is 2023. And this just um, underscores the fact that there's a lower ability and less of a willingness on the part of, of banks to extend credit, given the backup in yields and what's going on in their portfolios. So why do we care about that? On the next slide, it looks at small businesses. So if you look on the far left, you can see that banks account for almost 70% of small business funding. And if there's a lower ability and a less of a willingness to extend credit, that could hurt um, small businesses in our economy, which are not insignificant. The next slide basically underscores the fact that almost 50% of all companies reflected in green, uh, dark blue, and light blue. Those are small companies that have less than 500 employees. Um, the small uh, businesses are certainly a, a significant impact on our economy. If they're unable to get credit, those credit conditions tighten, uh, that will eventually have an impact on our, our, on our economic growth. On the next slide, I've talked uh, pretty much consistently over the last uh, 13 months about monetary policy acting with a lagged uh, impact. This is just a slide that looks at how long does it take as rates move up to ultimately filter through the economy and slow things down. Um, what this slide reflects, though, is we've got the lagged effects that slow economic growth over time. That's the top line. But more importantly is the lower line that spikes down. That reflects lower uh, uh, the, the lagged effect of a slowing economy due to increased rate in rate hikes, in addition to tighter credit conditions associated, again, with banks' unwillingness or inability to continue to lend uh, as they had previously. So I know that there's been talk about a soft landing. Uh, you know, Mike mentioned, and I think very, very highly of Jan Hatzius. He's one of the people that I do read. He didn't remove his expectation of percentage uh, for potential recession from 20%. I think it was 15, Mike. Um, so everyone's hoping for, including me, I'm hoping for a soft landing. But I'm skeptical. I do think that the number of rate hikes that we've seen, the magnitude of the, the hikes we've seen, uh, at some point will bite the economy. It may be a mild recession. 
Um, but I don't think we're quite out of the woods yet. We'll continue to, to watch and monitor that. Maybe one last slide for food for thought, and then we'll get on to performance. Um, this is the one thing that the Fed wants to try to avoid. This is an interesting slide where it looks at the rate hikes that we saw, and I'm sorry, not rate hikes, inflation, the 1970s and early 80s. For those of us that can remember that we had the two oil price shocks that caused rates, the inflation spike in the middle part of the 1970s, uh, and then again in the latter part of the 70s and early 80s. Um, and you can see that overlaying that in green is the recent CPI performance in terms of where we were in rates. That's on the, on the, uh, the, the left side. And the Fed wants to avoid that problem where they, they're successful, they get inflation down, but they don't really kill it. And then it roars back to, to, to ravage the economy again. Um, so that's why I think that the Fed will remain tighter for longer, keep rates higher for a longer period of time. It's really amazing how closely those lines are. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it is. It's quite scary. <laughs> Maybe skip ahead to performance, Wolf Raider or Kate, whoever's driving on slide 31. Sorry, third, uh, sorry, third, actually 130. There we go. Perfect. So this actually looks at the three month performance for the second count quarter of the calendar year 2023 or the fourth quarter fiscal year 2023. Um, but you can see the total uh, teachers plan up top includes private and public assets delivered a return in the quarter of 2.9%. More importantly, though, it's the one year return at 7.8%. And even more importantly than that is the five, the three, five, uh, year returns at uh, 6.7 and 6.5 percent. So as long-term investors, you really want to think, like, I know that's not really a long time horizon for a pension plan. We should be looking at 10 to 10 plus years. Uh, and I suspect Mike will cover this when he when he goes through the strategic asset allocation review. But again, uh, it's nice to see all green on the screen. We'd like to see those numbers a little higher. On the next side, a look at public market returns by strategy. Uh, and you can see again, equities on, and green up top in under three months, they've all performed well. Bonds have suffered a little bit with increase in, in, uh, in rates, notwithstanding tighter credit spreads. Um, but I think that we've already covered those issues. Um, public market excess returns, more specifically to the, on the next slide, to the active managers, the passive managers, you can see that we've outperformed, or I should say portfolios outperformed the benchmarks quite significantly for three months um, in uh, U.S. Russell 2000, uh, ex-U.S. Uh, developed and emerging markets, whereas, again, fixed income has been a little more challenged uh, in terms of um, just the backup and rates. Um, tips also have proven to be um, a challenging holding, notwithstanding the fact that inflation's kicked up because they tend to have a, a significantly higher duration exposure than, say, high yield. So you can ask a question. Sure, please. So it looks like the excess returns are up for Russell 3000 U.S. equity for the past three months, but every other longer duration, not so much. Is that that's, an active versus passive? Is that part of the That's a great question. It's a great observation, Alison. And that's exactly right. You can see we pretty consistently can outperform in active strategies outside the states that are less efficient markets. But please, um, that we'll just ask the question. The I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Alison Hirsch. Um, but that, that is perhaps one of the takeaways that uh, our active managers, and, and I should also reflect that our U.S. equity strategies uh, are almost 80% passive um, with some el small element of active management um, in that as well. Steve, uh, I'm Dave Kazansky. Uh, you knew that, but... Um... <laughs> So what happened with ETIs that they've, they, they seem to struggle, especially yeah. more recently? Those, those are economically targeted investments, they're, they're mortgage related. Uh, and they're, they're very uh, uh, subject to changes in rates. Um, there's also been uh, some challenges in, in real estate, not so much multifamily, which is the focus of the ETI program. Right. Um, but just again, a backup relative to the benchmark. So. Great. Uh, on the next slide, a quick look at our private manager returns. Uh, Ned, you can see that in the one-year space, there has been a little bit of challenge, and private equity has been a very, very strong performer consistently. If you look at three, five, ten years since its inception, uh, the performance driven by 
and Ash Cazzelli, the, the deputy CIO and his team have been really quite extraordinary. A little bit of revaluation with the equity sell-off on a lag basis in 2022, spilling into 2023. Uh, real estate core and non-core similarly uh, impacted. More of the challenge, I'd say, in, in real estate has been in office space and retail. Um, I know that John Glusak and his team have done a great job of managing that. So we're slightly uh, underweight those sectors relative to, say, multifamily um, and uh, self-storage and things of that nature. But again, a little bit of challenge in the uh, private space. Um, for me, that just means it's probably a better opportunity to, consider, to continue investing in those strategies because things are cheapening up a little bit. Infrastructure has actually proven to be quite a strong inflation hedge, uh, delivering an 8.1%. Um, uh, so again, uh, Petra Nikolova and her team have done a great job uh, there as well. An opportunistic fixed income, uh, also called private credit. Uh, it's got a num number of different names at this point. But again, as those those base rates have moved up, those credit spreads have, in, the, in the private side have been still pretty generous relative to public's tightening. Uh, delivered a positive return. We think that that uh, asset class has tremendous opportunity going forward as well. And I think it, what, what's very notable about that to, to us um, when we talk with Tina and, and Grace is really haven't seen um, for quite some time stress to stress and really more broadly uh, for many, many years. So it's been a very quiet cycle uh, to this point leading up to the last year or so. Um, and these returns, I think, in a very quiet cycle are, are fairly, fairly notable. Yeah. And so a lot of conviction with that, with that strategy. Most of those obligations are floating. It's a different kind of pricing dynamic there, but uh, we still think that's going to be a great area to invest going forward. And I suspect the team that just joined will probably underscore that. Um, maybe two more slides. Uh, just look at our excess returns and basis points for private markets on the next. Uh, sorry, one slide before, please. Um, the, obviously, a lot of green on the screen, which is great. Excess returns relative to the public market benchmarks have been really significant. Um, uh, OFI, or, or opportunistic fixed income, or private credit, has struggled a little bit in the last year. That's because its benchmark is a blend of high yield, which is public market, uh, and leveraged loans. And the public market for high yield credit spreads have actually tightened quite considerably, which is driving a little bit of that underperformance relative to that. Um, that that benchmark, but again, we still have a lot of conf conviction in Tina and Grace, uh, her team, and the asset class as well. And with that, I'll open up to uh, one one last look at rebalancing activities in the last slide. Um, as as Mike and Amanda and I've mentioned earlier, we had a pretty strong rally in equities earlier in the year, um, uh, up until August, uh, and more volatility, a little bit more of a sell off in um, a fixed income. And the rebalancing reflects that. So first and foremost, we've raised a lot of cash. We raised $540 million in cash to meet uh, benefit payments, uh, also capital calls for the private asset commitments you've already made. But as a general matter, on the left, you can see that we're selling equity strategies. And on the right, we're reallocating and buying uh, fixed income. We have a rebalance meeting every week where we actually look to, to the targets that you've given us. Uh, we don't take liberties around the targets. We try to strictly adhere to that. Uh, you know, taking into consideration uh, time and, and transaction costs, we we'll continually try to get back to that those those um, those those target rates. So that's reflected here. And with that, I'll open it up to any any questions. Thank you, Steve. Any questions for Steve? Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Appreciate it. Again, I'm Tom Brown, and just wanted to remind everyone to introduce yourself because we have a new. Uh, stenographer for this week. Thank you. So we go to the strategic asset allocation discussion. Mike, Steve, great. We're going to team play a little musical chairs. Um, let's maybe look for one more chair. Oh, That's sorry. Okay. Okay. Hi, how are you? So the question I asked when, when, when Michael brought his colleagues in and we were sat down, we had the privilege of working with these gentlemen earlier. I asked the question of the team, did the average IQ in the room just go up or down? Uh, and I think you'll find that it probably went up. So um, it's, been, it's been a pleasure. Here, here, Mike. Please. 
We, yeah, yes, uh, Steve started to say it, but uh, we, we've had a, a, a good summer of very collaborative project uh, in review of the strategic asset allocation. I know we chatted at the, the board meeting, uh, the investment meeting back in June about the process uh, and the work we'd be doing to review uh, strategic strategic asset allocation, not only in the context of our changes in capital market assumptions, but also uh, the, I'll say the constraints of the system uh, that help inform how we construct the portfolio. Um, and in working closely with Steve's team, I wanna also introduce my colleagues, Roy Appleman and Ben Cranes. Uh, Roy leads our, uh, head of, he's our head of research from the multi-asset solutions team. Uh, and Ben is a member of his team. They've been very involved in the process as we review the portfolio asset allocation. So uh, you'll be hearing definitely from them. And maybe what we'll do is I'll share uh, my screen so folks can follow along. So today what we wanted to do really is introduce everyone uh, to the outcomes of the discussions we've had to date around the, the portfolio's asset allocation, uh, remind you of what those constraints were that I referenced earlier and, and help you understand how we're thinking about tying together our forward-looking views uh, to potential changes in the portfolio strategic targets over time. So we revisit this uh, in a formal way for the IPS every three years. Um, I would say we're always thinking about what's going on in markets and asking ourselves uh, amongst the, the the advisory team, but also within Steve's team and, and the team at BAM, is there anything that we should be doing or thinking about that would require changing the portfolio? Are we hearing things in the marketplace that would prompt some change? And here, um, we're taking a very long-term view. So while there's a lot that was always going on, we're talking about changes in the shape of the yield curve, those, those changes, which could be notable, don't necessarily drive changes to the, the long-term strategic targets. Um, so here, what we're talking about is being very deliberate and setting a long-term strategy. And the fund itself, as you know, at a billion dollars in assets is a very large fund. And so we're very mindful of what changes can actually be implemented in any given period of time. And so that, that also helps inform how we're implementing any changes to the long-term strategic targets. So we'll, we'll leave in comments about our, our views forward and, and that came up in, in the comments uh, that Steve made a little bit earlier about the markets and where we see uh, the markets today. Um, but as we think about the constraints and what's really meaningfully different since we last went through this review three or so years ago, uh, I, I think there's two things that come to mind for me uh, and others can, can share their thoughts. Uh, we're at a point where the risk-free rate, as Steve noted earlier, the shape of the yield curve, the amount you can earn by investing in cash today is notably higher than it's been for really the last 10, 20 years. And so what that does is it, in our minds, shifts sort of the opportunity set for the ability to generate return, um, which would imply that today expected returns are generally higher than they've been. And that shows up in how we're projecting the forward-looking returns for a number of asset classes, all asset classes, as well as for the, the pension. The other thing that's uh, notably different, and we talked about this earlier this year, is uh, the shift in the rules set by, the, by New York State around the basket clause. So we talk, we've talked in the past about a 25% limit to, um, generally speaking, illiquid assets uh, that, that are assigned uh, to the identifier that they are basket assets. Um, and that has helped, I would say, guide strategy in the past such that we've allocated two basket assets up to around that 24, 25% limit. When New York State changed that rule and expanded the flexibility around the basket, moved that limit from 25 to 35%, that was, a, I would say, a key catalyst for taking a step back and thinking about where the, where the system could benefit from deploying a portion of that budget to earn incremental excess returns or incremental returns uh, for the system. Uh, and so that was a key part of the portfolio construction work we did in looking at where could uh, or where should we think about deploying the next dollar of assets uh, to take advantage of that flexibility and earn that incremental return. So um, what you see here in the material thus far is, is really just intended to set a baseline. So we have uh, you know, current portfolio 
assets, Steve noted, and just shy of about 100 billion on June 30th. Uh, with portfolio targets, I'm going to paint some broad brush strokes here, but about 46% of the pension uh, is allocated to public equities, another 20% allocated to alternative assets such as private equity, private real estate infrastructure, and, and private debt. Uh, and then another 33% allocated to public fixed income. Uh, I would say if you look over time at, at the strategic targets of the systems, they've moved around generally in the same neighborhood. Um, about 10 or 15 years ago, you would have seen definitely a lower allocation to some of those illiquid alternatives. Uh, the allocations and the commitments made to help those, those parts of the investment program mature over time have brought you to where you are today. Uh, and what we've been thoughtful and thinking about in the past was really how much active, how much risk you want to deploy uh, between public equities and public fixed income. Today, what we're talking about is, um, and when we start talking about different alternative portfolios, is how are we going to uh, consider using up some of that basket capacity deploying that additional capital within alternative assets. That's possibly the biggest change we're looking at in terms of portfolio exposure. And where are we sourcing uh, that those incremental allocations from? And, and some of that comes from public equities. Some of that also comes from public fixed income. The other dynamic we're gonna talk about, something that's a little bit different, is, is really what we see as a potentially additional source of diversification. Uh, that we'd like to consider introducing to the asset allocation. Um, and so those, those strategies, that, that source of diversification, uh, we'll refer to them as CTAs or trend following strategies, uh, which, which actually are a, comprised of multiple asset classes uh, in terms of how they could be constructed and designed. But we think that that actually incorporates something that's a little bit different than the diversification you would get by introducing, for example, interest rate exposure and fixed income to the equity portfolio. So I'll pause there and see if there's any questions before we push ahead into uh, looking at some of the different portfolio alternatives we developed with BAM. Any questions for Mike? Sorry, Mike. Okay. So I'm gonna pull up this slide, slide number six, which includes a lot of numbers. Um, so what I'll try to do is, is just in being mindful of that, uh, reference only some of the numbers on this page. Um, I noted earlier the current asset allocation. You can see that in the first column of numbers. Today at a high level, what we're expecting is about a 7.1% expected compound return for current portfolio uh, with, a, with an expected volatility of about 10.7%. Uh, the portfolios we're looking at in all of the alternatives here are expected to increase that level of compound return as we look forward. That's, um, that's something that we think we can achieve by making any of the changes on this page. Uh, with, with two of the three portfolio alternatives on this page, uh, we're also seeing a modest increase in the expected volatility of the portfolio. Uh, and what I would note is in our conversations with BAM and amongst ourselves, we think that those portfolios um, would provide you, even though there's a higher level expected volatility, the return you're compensated for taking those risks. That's not to say that we're recommending we would go all the way out to portfolio two on the risk spectrum, but these are intended to show you um, sort of the extremes that we would think about. And one of the other things we're obviously very mindful of is when we're looking at these portfolios, we do still have a basket constraint. How much of that basket constraint or budget are we allocating um, to basket assets. So I noted today you're about 24, 25%. Um, what we're looking at in terms of these different portfolios is, is looking to top that out at about 31% uh, sort of on the extreme and recognizing that if we saw a drawdown in public markets, it's very possible to get right up again to that 35% or slightly surpass it. Uh, because as you know, and as we've lived through very recently in the last couple of years is, uh, when public markets draw down, we're not seeing the same drawdown on private market assets based on how they're being market markets. So that's something we're very cognizant of. Um, portfolio one is the one that I wanted to focus on uh, the most today. Uh, this is one that 
in our discussions with BAM, we think is is a, is a, an intuitive and attractive portfolio to consider for the and for the board to think about. Um, and and sort of the key differences there, uh, what I'll draw your attention to is, is within the alternative assets portfolio, and that's where we're seeing the most change uh, in in terms of potential allocation changes. Uh, private equity, you can see there uh, an increase of about three percent contemplated in that portfolio a 1% incremental allocation to each of private real estate, private infrastructure, and uh, opportunistic fixed income. And then you also see below that, again, that, that additional asset category I, I cited earlier, CTAs, commodity trading advisors, which Roy is gonna talk a little bit more about and help provide the board with more context on, on what those strategies really are, why we think they're attractive and how they help to diversify exposure in the portfolio. Um, but what you see when you look at that portfolio in general is uh, an increase in expected returns. As I said, you, you see that with all of these, um, but an increase in the expected compound return to about seven and a quarter, 7.3%, a modest increase in the expected volatility portfolio of the portfolio, but also uh, a very, I would say, a slightly more efficient portfolio, efficiency being measured in what we call sharp ratio. So the, the return... Uh, divided by uh, the return in excess of cash divided by volatility. Um, I noted uh, if you're going to increase one thing, you have to decrease something else. So uh, with the increase in alternative assets there, uh, and again, using up some of that basket, bringing the basket allocation to about 31%, you're taking down allocations uh, to public fixed income as well as public equity. So we're incrementally adding expected volatility of the portfolio um, and, and actually taking down public equity and public fixed income helps to moderate the amount of incremental risk you're allocating in the portfolio um, because public equities continue to be one of the more volatile asset classes for modeling. So public equities uh, in portfolio one would go down to about 41%, public fixed income down to about 27, 28%. Within public fixed income, I guess more notably, and Steve made some comments about this earlier, is we see uh, increased value in allocating uh, slightly away from treasuries and incrementally more into credit, corporate credit, both investment grade and high yield, getting value for, um, you know, for the, the additional risk you take in credit spreads today as we look forward. Um, we continue to like fixed income as a, diverse, a key diversifier in the portfolio, so we're not in any way considering that we would be replacing that exposure in the portfolio. It's, it's the best way to, to diversify the equity risk, which really overwhelms uh, the proportion of risk in the portfolio. Um, and and investing, excuse me, investment grade fixed income still in, in many respects is the key driver of that diversification. So I'll pause there and see if there's any comments or questions. Uh, and then I'll make a couple of brief comments about why we're showing portfolios two and three as well. Mike, can I ask just to comment on the cash holding of just a half of 1%, uh, which really reflects reality in terms of how we manage the portfolio. So typically we haven't had an allocation of cash. We've always had cash holdings in the portfolio. We typically try to manage that around one half of 1%. So a lot of times if you look at a cash uh, allocation in a portfolio like this, it's four or 5%. It implies to me that it's more tactical and it's going somewhere else. And we're not making those active decisions and actively managing the allocation. A half of 1% really just reflects the fact that we always need some cash on hand every month to meet benefit payments and to also meet the capital calls for the private asset commitments. The other point I think, Mike, is the combination of the core, not core real estate into one uh, private real estate allocation. Uh, it used to be broken out, but we're advocating that if we combine those, we may have a little bit more flexibility to look for opportunities across core, non core. Yep, I, I would say it allows. Um... The, the real estate team at BAM to be more flexible and follow the opportunities. So when, when there's an expectation that you'll be compensated for opportunistic real estate relative to core, finding commit, uh, making commitments and finding where the opportunities focused in that part of the market, we don't want to be as uh, as the tied to a specific target. And I'd say the last comment I would ask, uh, respectfully, Ed Berman's been really a yeah. wonderful uh, partner uh, of mine and the teams and we're working on all the general consultants. Ed, anything I missed here? Uh, no, I will say that uh, some problems, it's been a wonderful experience uh, yeah. with, with Rockman's team. Uh, it's a wonderful yeah. operation. Excuse me, who was...
you think give Ben and Roy a shout out that we've actually invited both of them to come back and actually just talk to us. So gentlemen, yeah, so uh, sorry. I take it Who is that speaking? Ed, Ed Berman. He's too far away from the place. It's uh, Ed Berman, uh, the chief risk officer for the Bureau of Asset Management. Thank you. So yeah, Mike, before you go on, um, <clears throat> could you guys go into a little bit of your thought process as to in the public uh, in public equity why the why the the big reduction in the <laughs> markets? Yep, absolutely. So uh, the change in allocations that you see here, what that really reflects is moving to align the overall public equity portfolio uh, to be more in line with that of the global market cap as it's broken down today. So if um, if you looked at the, for example, MSCI Acqui Index, the total global uh, public equity market, uh, that is roughly 20% emerging markets today. And what we're talking about is taking the current allocation to EM and bringing it more in line with that, that 20%. Um, it's, a, I would say, a reflection that, you know, we, we think that the current global um, market capitalization is largely reflective of where we should expect global growth looking forward. Um, and any, anything else you'd elaborate on? Anyway? Yeah, I, I guess maybe just to add to that a little bit, right? We do think there is a lot of efficiency in markets. Uh, I'm sorry, that, that's Roy Appleman now. Thank you. And... So I think, right, generally speaking, we think there is a lot of efficiency in markets, and that's reflected in market prices and essentially the capitalization of the indices. And this is a reflection of the fact that we think that the opportunity set in emerging markets is more in line with what you would consider to be the opportunity sets on comparable risk in equity investments and less of an excess opportunity than before. Great. Thank you. I, I briefly referenced uh, portfolios two and three. I just want to make a, a couple comments about what those portfolios represent uh, in our minds. And uh, and then I'll turn it over to Roy to speak more about uh, CTAs or trend following strategies and the value we think they bring. But actually, um, portfolio two is, is largely representative of portfolio one's changes in broad allocations without that allocation to CTAs or trend following strategies. And so the difference you see in um, expected risk and return there uh, are, are being largely driven by the incremental amount of diversification you get by allocating the CTAs. So CTAs are expected to provide a positive absolute return to the portfolio, but I would say, you know, well, not, not well, but below that of public equities and, and public, um, excuse me, alternative assets. Uh, and so... If you were to, for example, adopt portfolio one without the CTAs, portfolio two is what you might expect in terms of a broad risk and return um, uh, scenario. And, and really what, what portfolio um, three illustrates is, is a portfolio that has a, a number of changes at the end of, at the, end of the day. Um, if you allocated, for example, to portfolio three, you would include the CTAs, but you see sort of the incremental um, or, or the lower expected return and lower expected volatility of not allocating quite as much to alternative assets. Um, I think in our minds, portfolio two is, is interesting, uh, but we like the diversification you get and the risk mitigation you get by introducing CTAs, which is why from our perspective, portfolio one seems to be a little bit more attractive uh, on a, on a uh, risk adjusted basis or from an efficiency basis. So maybe um, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Roy, to speak uh, at a high level. There's a lot of information here on trend strategies. Um, and, you know, we're not going to go slide by slide, but, but Roy will have some comments on that. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Um, so if I can turn your attention to page nine, I'll keep my initial comments brief. And if there are any questions, of course, happy to take them. So first of all, a little bit about what trend following strategies are. In many ways, um, the truth is in the name. What trend following strategies are, are strategies that aim to identify and follow 
absolute and relative trends that are emerging in markets. And the strategies are traded in public markets uh, across asset classes. The typical strategy would trade 50 or more different types of tradables around equities, commodities, effects, and interest rates. And the strategies will trade both absolute and relative trend, depending on the actual implementation. And, and they, so they've been around for quite some time. So even though the strategies might be a bit new to teachers, and they have been around for over 40 years and do feature in portfolios of other public pension plans in, in this nation. In terms of the characteristics of the strategies, as Michael mentions, the expected returns are lower than in that of equities and other alternatives. Although if you do look at the actual back-tested information on page 10, you would see comparable back-tested returns to that of equities. However, our view is that on a go-forward basis, that is not likely to repeat. It is, so we, we, one might ask, if the expected returns are lower, why are we adding them to the portfolio? We're recommending adding them to the portfolio for few reasons. The first is that if we look at the current environment, even though rates are higher and bonds remain attractive, there is an extra risk that has become a little bit more pertinent in, in portfolios going forward which is the fact that going forward, just because of where inflation is, where it might go, there is a bit of a higher risk that the correlation between equities and bonds, it may not be as reliable as it has been in the past. Trend following strategies do well when the macroeconomic environment begins to trend in a specific way. So if we do get a repeat of what we saw in 2022, where we do get a bit more inflationary pressures that react over time, trend following strategies would do would benefit the portfolios. So essentially, this is another tool in the toolbox to help smoothen the ride a little bit on a go forward basis, and is part of what's driving that increased in sharp ratio expectation for portfolio one relative to what we currently hold today. The other reason in the we um, like in trend following strategies as a recommendation is the fact that in their correlation characteristic to the portfolio can be quite negative. Um, and they do that with a positive expected return overall. So essentially, in some ways, um, that's really a bit of a very attractive outcome, something that has a low or negative correlation to your portfolio, but positive expected return is not easy to find and is not, and is very beneficial to the overall risk adjusted returns of the portfolios. So even at a relatively modest allocation of 2%, it is starting to have a little bit of an impact. Uh, although in all fairness, the impact is more incremental then it is absolute because you know two percent of the portfolio is just two percent. So from our perspective, this is a strategy that is a little bit more defensive, is a little bit more better geared towards more pronounced or prolonged slowdowns in the economy, and is one that helps add something additional to the equity and bond centric nature of the existing portfolio. So, of course, happy to take um, any questions um, and discuss further. Thank you, Roy. Any questions for Roy? Um, yes, I have a number of questions okay. about... Oh, sorry. sorry. Brian Berge. I'm from uh, Mayor's Office of Pensions and Investments. I'm representing Mayor Eric Adams as a trustee. Um, so I, I had a number of questions, some of which are for BAM, and I think some of which are for Rokatan about CTAs. So I guess I'll start with the Rokatan questions. So uh, CTAs are new for us, as you said, and I, I sort of struggle to kind of understand them conceptually. <laughs> um, so the, the first question I have is, is if you're getting 2%, um, what are they substituting for, so to speak, in the portfolio? What other asset classes would you draw down to make the allocation to the 2% to CTAs? 
and what reason for that substitution? Yeah, would you? Uh, so you absolutely. Provide? I mean, so we think about the portfolio as a whole, but if you had to choose one, you could say that the CTAs are probably augmenting your bond allocation. So the high quality bond allocation, uh, which is a very good diversifier in the portfolio, and we still have a confidence in. But if you look at what the, the bond allocation largely helps in, it's environments where both growth and inflation slow down. Essentially, more of a traditional recession uh, in line of what we've had a few times over the last 25 years. Where the trend following strategies help a little bit more is when the change in direction in the macro environment is a little different, essentially one where inflation also becomes a participant of why you get a slowdown in the economy. So it's less linked to just a specific macro outcome and is one that is a little bit more focused on reacting to conditions as they actually materialize. And is the behavior of a CTA strategy dependent on the nature of the trend that is affecting the macroeconomic environment? I mean, does it, it seems sort of mutable in a way that I don't think of other asset classes as being so mutable? That's a very, very good question. I would say that it's less, it's less dependent on the actual nature of the trend because the strategies, if they're well-constructed, will follow the different types of trend that materialize. But where there is clearly a dependence is the speed in which directions change. So if you compare two recent environments, and you can see that on page 11, perhaps, you can see that in some environment, trend followings will do really, really well, while in others, less so. So in environments such as 2008 or 2022, when the emerging trends tended to be multi-month trends because these were major macroeconomic driven crises, the trend following strategies did very well relative to equities and bonds. But in 2020, when the reaction was very short term driven, the emergence of the pandemic, trend following strategies tended to have more mixed results. So it's that speed of market reaction that matters more than the actual type of trend that's emerging. Okay, and I, the third question I have for Rokotan on this is, is there a concern in this asset class about like a sort of internal style drift? Because it seems to me there's not always gonna be some clear transcendent objective reality as to what the <laughs> macroeconomic trends are, you know? So I, I would, again, I guess this kind of gets back to the, seeming mutability of the asset class, but is there concern that once you select a manager, they are changing their views about what trends are applicable in a way that isn't consistent with your original vision of their selection? So that's a great question as well. Um, style drift is always a concern with any sort of a manager selection process. And part of the manager selection team is to continue to monitor the integrity of the investment of the state of the investment process versus the actual investment process. But what I would highlight here is that with trend following strategies, what you try and do is not choose a strategy that tries to only depend on specific trends, but rather choose this manager based on a process that identifies emerging trends well and has good risk management practices in some ways, irrespective of what the trend is. Um, and I think that's part of the due diligence that has to happen when selecting this specific strategy. I, I would just add on to that. And, and I know Ed, might, Ed has a lot of experience with, with these types of strategies too. So I'd welcome your input. Um, the It speaks to the importance around, um, in addition to those factors, thinking about how that manager is improving, researching, and updating their process to ensure that they're not missing, you know, what are paradigm shifts in the marketplace over time. Uh, and so um, the other thing that I, I think I should emphasize 
is when we're talking about CTAs and trend following, and, and there are different types of approaches, different types of firms who, who do this or employ this type of strategy. We're talking very much about what, what many in the industry refer to as systematic trend following, uh, where, where there, it's very much about this risk control process, as Roy noted, and less about um, you know, someone just making an active decision um, and, and not following sort of a rules-based approach. Okay. So I, I appreciate that reference to due diligence because that provides an elegant pivot for my, my questions to Bam. Um, how do, well, I guess maybe for both of you, how do we envision this working from a due diligence perspective? We obviously don't have a CTA specialty consultant. Um, would this be something that falls within the purview of the general consultant? Would we anticipate getting a CTA specialty consultant? It would probably be, go through a procurement process. We would hire someone that's expert in managing these types of strategies. Um, we actually have someone on our team um, at Berman who actually used to oversee these and implement these types of strategies in his prior life. But we would actually outsource it um, and we'd go through a procurement process. But we company. would need due diligence. We would need some internal capacity to due diligence. Oh, of course. How we yeah. hire. Yeah, I'm Brennan. sorry. Yes, that. Yeah. I misunderstood the question. We have expertise. <laughs> I, I have some experience and familiarity with CTAs. Uh, Ed's is much more uh, uh, deep, I'd say. Um, so if I, I, I just want close to the microphone, Ed Bowman. Uh, thank you. Um, so just put it slight in the context. Uh, uh, I, I do have experience with CTAs, part of uh, working at the JP Morgan Asset Management within Mark Asset Solution, the capacity of an investment director. Uh, so I have about uh, seven years of experience uh, always seeing uh, systematic strategies. CTA was part of it. I uh, participated in the launch of several products uh, and also worked with uh, the board's regulators in uh, Luxembourg, Ireland, and also in the US. Uh, I think there are some of your questions. Uh, it is a systematic strategy, and uh, there are a lot of choices that go into uh, writing the strategy. So it goes through the usual magic selection process. Uh, much like you think about uh, investing in equities, the numerous strategies across the spectrum of equity investment. Right? But part of our magic selection process is to find a strategy that fits best within our portfolio construction. I would say the advantage of CTA uh, it operates within a pre-selected universe of markets. So as Roy mentioned, it relies on uh, macro trends, but the implementation relies on markets. So it can be a choice of products within equities, effects, interest rates, commodities. And then such trends can capture a broad range of outcomes. For example, if equity markets go into a protracted bear market, trend following strategy will pick up this sell-off and will provide an offset. If uh, the equity markets uh, move higher, CTA again can catch this trend and participate in the upside. In case of an inflation environment, uh, it will do the same focusing on the bond futures. CTA may provide the offset for inflation or deflation environment. The same applies to uh, effects of commodities markets. And of course, here we're mindful of uh, existing restrictions on energy, uh, there's absolutely no need to uh, use energy futures or energy products. There's a broad range of commodities other than energy. So clearly the implementation is mindful of the broader goals of the system. And it definitely can be implemented within this restriction. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for that. It seemed like it, that was more about the manager selection and maybe I phrased my question badly. I was trying to ask, Specifically, do we anticipate hiring a specialty consultant in the way that we have specialty consultants for certain of our other asset classes? Um, will we be? So. Uh, so that's, we have a problem, I most likely not. I, I think the key no. to, to transform strategies, as Roy mentioned, it's been around for a very long time. It's a well known process. And uh, much like I will draw a parallel with public equities. Public equities exist in the hedge, hedge fund framework. Sure. They exist in the mutual fund or just SMA the way we use them. Uh, the difference is how you use the strategy level of risk you take, how systematic they are. 
So we can think about uh, transforming strategies, a hedge fund strategy, which they do exist, that will go to a specialty consultant. Uh, I don't believe there's any need for that. It's not the objective. Uh, no, this need to pay the level of fees commanded by hedge funds. This really implementation within public markets, within public managers. So I would imagine it's just a standard public manager search within the existing infrastructure we currently have. Within okay. They fall in the process yeah. public equity and public fixed thing. Great. We have a hedge fund right now that we oversee for police and fire that has similar type of strategy again, different. This is not a hedge fund. Uh, but it's some of the sure. same types of and in that case, we, we do, as Ed said, run it through a special yes. consultant, but it sounds that's like right. we do. While that's it's not, not included at the moment, that's not necessarily the thinking right now that we have a need for a special consultant. So, Alice and I don't want to cut you off. So, so okay, so I'm going to go. Yes, I, I just can't stop myself. Um, I'll wait as patiently as you need to, Mr. Oh Pat. my gosh, the, my patience, is, everyone else's patience is when they get all those <laughs> <laughs> um, the second question, you mentioned manager search, manager selection. Is there a view as to whether this would be a PPD governed situation or a non-PPD governed situation? Just a, my two cents on that is um, I, the, the PPD process is A little bit more challenging when you're looking for customization uh, and and constructing a portfolio that is specifically structured to the constraints and objectives of of TRS, like we were talking about. So the exclusion, for example, in commodity futures, the the PPB approach lends itself well when there's a very set track record that meets sort of the objectives and constraints that you lay out. Um, because this would be, I think, a little bit more bespoke to how teachers would prefer to implement. It's it's a little bit more challenging to do it that way. And so we haven't really mm -hmm. stepped through ultimately how we could go through the procurement process. Or the construction and the implementation. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Well, I, I, I appreciate that that is not necessarily a question for Rokopan, but it's a concern that I would have given difficulty. Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's not about preference necessarily it's just about does it have to go through it or not um but that's just a concern that i would put in people's minds and maybe we shouldn't continue that discussion uh, right now because it seems pretty unsolved um i have just one comment to follow up and then a, a question and i do think if we were to uh, introduce ctas as a, you know a new asset class basically there is an entire conversation about implementation that we have not had yet because we don't have it around what what staffing would need to look like in BAM to execute if there needs to be any different. Does it make sense to a consultant? Isn't it? I don't know whether it goes against the basket or not. And I think then there and what the procurement procedures are. I feel like there's legal advice that needs to come into play as well. But so that's I just want to that out there because I think a lot of those questions we just I, I don't know the answers to and it doesn't feel like we do. Some yet. of them we're still working through, and I should have noted earlier we took a more conservative approach with proxying the impact to the basket. And in this case, counted the full allocation against the basket budget. Because I, I know it, that there have been some legal problems. Yep. Um, and then my other question is just that, um, and Ed, you you mentioned it, so it helped me lead into this, but you know, I know very little about investing, obviously, or have learned, but anytime the CTAs have come up, it's always been within the context of the hedge fund. And this board is, very clearly the not wanted to invest in hedge funds and so how is this not a hedge fund <laughs> approach in a different with a different rest? Oh sure. Do you want to start? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. I, uh it's simple as it, it, it just not simple answer the question. Uh, I wish all questions were that. Uh, it definitely could be, and uh, there are a fair number of hedge funds that uh, utilize uh, Fed Forward as part of the investment process. Uh, there's also a broad range of asset managers, just mainstream asset managers. You can name JP Morgan, just my personal experience. Uh, Morgan Stanley, and he was, I believe Goldman Sachs has yeah. strategies within public markets uh, running uh, mutual funds, uh, mostly in Europe, uh, SMAs, 
institutionally that place. Uh, so it's a well-established strategy. I have to say it's not a retail strategy, even though there are some retail products in this field, but they're not very widespread. It's very much an institutional product. Maybe that's one reason why we haven't heard as much about it in this context. Um, I, mean, and I, you I can just, just add to that a little bit, just a few things. I mean, in some ways, right, hedge funds are a fee structure, not an asset class. So first of all, the fee levels are completely different these days. The second thing I would note is the liquidity profile is very different. These are traded in liquid markets and both the liquidity in terms of what's traded as well as the liquidity the plan would have is a different profile potentially than, than hedge funds. And then the final thing that I would just add, trend following, as we noted, has been around for 40 years and back tested over a hundred. So if there's something here that's more persistent about markets as opposed to the more skill-based component reliance on hedge funds. So there is, so those are the three things that I think primarily differentiate it from from hedge funds and make it quite Can I, um, that's very helpful. Can I can ask two follow-up questions on that because that may led me to another question. The fees, so the fee structure is more in line with how we look at fees in the public markets as opposed to the private equity or in the other boards, the two and 20, that kind of thing. So it's a much smaller fee structure. Um, and then my other question is mentioned some institutional strategy. Do we know of other pension funds that utilize this strategy in the U.S.? So I mean, I don't know if I can. I mean, do you want to? I don't know. If, it's it, it's definitely reasonably prevalent, particularly in the West Coast, in public pension plans. I'm not even talking about non-public, but within the public plans as well. I mean, specific names. I don't know if we want to mention, but I mean, they're public, right? Asset allocation. Yeah, Cal Calpers has uh, had these strategies. But so, Calpers has a not at their hedge fund. They have a CTA strategy separate and apart from a hedge fund strategy. Um, they have a. My recollection is what they more broadly call uh, liquid. Risk. Liquid. Well, their their yeah. plans plans that tend to have risk mitigating baskets have CTAs within those risk mitigating pools of their plans. separate and apart from the hedge. Fund. Separate and apart from hedge funds. Thank you. I'm, I just want to kind of pile on with what Allison and, and Brian were mentioning earlier, which is, and I know the only thing more challenging than figuring out where the markets are going is figuring out where the trustees are, uh, you know. But do you see a, a scenario by which we, we decide that we want to include CTAs, but the implementation of that meets some kind of roadblock amongst us, and and what are what would we do if we've agreed to a strategic asset allocation and voted on it, let's say, and then implementing that CTA, you know, bucket doesn't work for one reason or another. What would our strategy be? Beyond that, I guess I guess the bigger question really is: Do you see any kind of circumstance where implementing it would just be impossible? Um, I don't at this point. I, I would say just to mention just one thing where we may have potential issue is around the basket loss. So just as Alison mentioned before, uh, we need to do some legal work uh, to understand if these products are uh, subject to basket loss or not. Uh, I believe uh, there were several studies, New York Commons and us did the studies years back on the interpretation of the basket clause. And I think legal conclusions were quite different. So this is a dispersion. Uh, I believe our interpretation was fairly conservative at the time, uh, just to be on the safe side. Um, we may revisit this question going forward. Uh, so one potential roadblock I can see in the future if we decide to scale it to one meaningful level, just as Roy mentioned, at two percent, it's more of a test case, and just to get everybody comfortable with it to allow for the magic selection, but it's probably not enough to have a really meaningful difference at the portfolio level. So we need to scale it up. Um, that said, we do have a fairly significant amount of breathing space in, in the basket clause right now. And uh, fundamentally, the products ultimately represent U.S. equities, U.S. bonds. So 
I'm not a lawyer, so I, I don't really want to give any promises, but I think a good case to be made that uh, the legal interpretation can be revisited and should be revisited. And any other concerns around implementation, whether it's the cost of hiring someone to oversee this or, or any complications within it that, that might? I, I think there were questions around procurement process is something that we should we should have a couple more conversations around just to understand what would be required and, and what you know what the hurdles would be um so i i i don't have a straight answer because i think that those are things that we should talk about before the board approves a final final allocation right that'd be helpful thank you but just one final thing i want to mention just to follow up on roy's point before these products are probably as liquid as it gets. So it's never a question of getting into the position, deploying capital or terminating. Mm -hmm. So liquidity access to markets is not a concern for these type of strategies. Mm -hmm. So it's entirely transparent and uh, liquid. Great. Great. So one final question, I promise. Brian, <laughs> and I'm probably tired of hearing from you actually. Um, I think this is implicit in what you're saying, but this this the structure is not like an LPGP structure as it is in many of alternative assets. It's more akin to a conventional manager contract. Okay, thank you. It, it is actually. It is a conventional yeah. manager contract. A, a conventional manager contract, and I believe that the fact that a separate, account, a separate yeah. account holding these exposure. Exactly. So the SMA yeah. was standard. So it's similar to public equity, public fixed income in a sense. With a procurement cost that comes with it, of course. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I'm going to just conclude by saying today was what we anticipated would be the first of several discussions, and um, you know, clearly, in, as you think through this and, and questions come up, please let us and Dan know how we can help uh, explain more, answer questions, uh, and continue to step the road. Thank you, Michael. Any more questions for the team? Just make a comment, sure. uh, Steve Meyer, for the record. This is, um, we go into the strategic asset allocation review with the hope that we can wrap this up by the end of October, November. We don't want the tail to wear the dog. Obviously, the trustees have to get comfortable and make ultimately make a determination. But given the fact that we're recommending, or I should say, Rokatan is recommending an increase in the allocation to private assets, wanted to make sure we can incorporate that into the pacing plans. 2024 and beyond and we typically do those around november um it's not to put an artificial constraint on the trustees um, but it's just a reflect that that's one of the things we're hoping to be able to, to, to get through and get can we sort of request and obviously i'm happy to help facilitate this process that we sort of try to get to buy some of the and some answers on the implementation questions before we come back next month so that we can have a- Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Ben, you didn't get a chance to say anything you want to have to jump in. It was all well said. Thank you. Hey, uh, Allison, uh, we're next, I guess, with the invitation to yeah. join Labor Rights Investor Network. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, as trustees know, um, this board, along with four other uh, New York City pension funds, has taken a very active approach as fiduciaries and shareholders across um, our portfolio to um, ensure that the money we invest is done so in a way that um, increases long-term uh, financial return for the companies we invest in and the pension funds. And we have believed and continue to believe that in order to ensure long-term uh, profitability, uh, workers have to be treated well and have to have freedom of association and the right to organize and that 
the way workers are treated is a core part of how companies thrive. And um, as you know, we have been leaders in that space um, through a uh, shareholder proposal that this board has put forward at Starbucks and other places, um, Amazon, uh, Chipotle, et cetera. Um, we have therefore been asked to join as sort of convening members of a new sort of network called the International Labor Network. Um, we would be the only pension fund as the, or only, the, we're asking all five systems support this, um, the only U.S. pension funds um, at the convening table, but it will include the AFL, uh, CWA, um, Uni Global, which is the Global Federation of Service Workers Unions, um, and others, and these are the folks that we have been partnering with to um, informally, as much as formally, to uh, put forward our corporate governance approach. So instead of having, uh, rather than having like controller lander sign on, we thought it would be much more powerful. And uh, if all of the trustees were willing to have the pension fund sign on officially. Um, and so that is what we are recommending and asking for approval of today. Any questions for Allison? Any comments? So I guess just for the record, we'll show that we are in agreement or not in agreement perhaps. So why don't we, for the record, take a vote. So do I hear a motion to uh, perhaps accept the invitation to join the Labor Rights Network? So we can have that on record. Sure. I will make a motion to uh, join the Labor Rights Network. I second. Great. So it's seconded to uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Great. So I, uh, I like to abstain. Okay. Let the record show that great we abstained. So this does pass. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, Allison has an update on the uh, BAM University. Yes. So um, you should all have calendar invitations for um, two Fridays in September Friday, September 22nd, Friday, September 29th. Um, uh, in the controller's office um, to, we are having a sort of a two-day training. Um, one thing that has become clear over the last really year and a half since I've been in this role and since Steve started, et cetera, is that, um, you know, trustees across the five systems really don't actually know the process within that BAM takes with the consultant in partnership with the consultants from inception to completion of any one investment, how does a recommendation actually come to the trustees, a manager recommendation? How does, why doesn't a manager, another manager recommendation come to the trustees and some do, et cetera. And so we are putting together a two-day training um, to walk through the work that BAM does on behalf of the trustees to um, go sort of step-by-step from asset allocation through on the public markets on day one, we're gonna be focusing on the public markets and what, what is the RP process? What are the factors that go into the procurement? How does the process move forward? Why does it take so long? Although we're trying to fix that, um, et cetera. And then, and what is all the work that the staff does on behalf of the trustees throughout that process? And then the second day we'll be focusing on private markets. Um, in addition, to that, um, as many of you know, we are launching the STAR project, the Strategic and Tactical Accountability Review, um, thanks to uh, Tom's participation as one of the oversight committee members and, and Brian's. Um, we um, are in the final stages of hiring McKinsey to take on that review. Um, they will be sitting in on the, um, the two-day training. Um, and at the end of the last day, um, will be, uh, the BAM staff will leave actually in the final session of the last day of the second day training will be trustees and McKinley so that as McKinley, McKinley kicks McKinley. off, will be the kickoff McKinley. of their McKinsey. McKinsey, sorry. Um, I'm in school mode, McKinley, like middle school. <laughs> McKinsey, um, as McKinsey, that will be the sort of kickoff of McKinsey's work because they want to start by hearing from trustees after seeing how BAM currently functions what you as trustees see as needs lacking, et cetera, to really frame the work that they're going to do. 
Um, we are also finalizing potential outside speakers, um, trying to figure out how to balance um, bringing some good external talent in as well with like a real desire to really dig in deep to the work that BAM does so that there's a clear understanding of everything that goes into what you all vote on every month or what we vote on every month. Um, the last thing is you, as I said, you all have calendar invitations. The agenda with more detail is going out hopefully today or tomorrow. Um, I would suggest that if you can attend to please just accept the calendar invitation because DORSA is on like phone bank, you know, GOTV duty to make sure anybody who is not committed to coming gets a call. So, you know, you can choose if you want to talk to DORSA over and over again <laughs> over the next two weeks. Feel free to ignore the calendar invite. And if, I'll just ask you. Yeah. <laughs> and if you just want to say yes, then uh, you will be free from a call and we'll see you on the 26th. Allison, would you resend that calendar invitation? It might have been Buried under. It definitely went out over the summer, so yes, it will be going back out today. Great, great, thank you. Or for tomorrow, that. after Good. Any questions for Allison and Bam University? Great, thank you. I think we're ready to go out of uh, general session and into executive session. So, do I hear a, a motion? So moved. Great. Do I hear a second? Second. <laughs> It's been seconded. Uh, all in favor of going into executive session, please say aye. 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 All those in public say nay. Thank you. We are in executive session. Perhaps we can take a 10 minute break and come back there. Uh, 12. Great. We're back in public session. Great. At this time, we'll have a readout from Ron Swingle. Thank you. Uh, this is Ron Swingle, uh, TRS Investment speaking. <laughs> Uh, in the executive session of the pension fund, we received preliminary performance data. We received a presentation on a real estate commitment. Consensus was reached. We received a real estate presentation. Consensus was reached. And we received two alternative credit presentations, which consensus was reached on both. Great. Do you have any questions? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Well, motion. No. Oh, sorry. I thought somebody did. Oh, oh. <laughs> Second? Great. I certainly do not oppose. Uh, all those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. Aye. Everybody aye. opposed. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you.